welcome to the last lecture now here is the i mean it's it's a kind of a course where you always feel that even you one can do a little more or not a little more much more but anyway one has to put a stop at some point so here is what i am going to do today I'll, i think i said this last time i'll very quickly describe the bit spinnerton dyer conjecture and then finally wind up by showing you um, how elliptic curves over complex numbers are equivalent to torus okay so let's start to with that uh, recalling the our discussion earlier that over elliptic curves the zeta function that we define the and there is a cor analog corresponding power series so that power series being modular is essentially equivalent to a zeta function having a functional equation and that functional equation was symmetric along the line metric around real z equals 1 right so the corresponding version of riemann hypothesis for this would be that all the zeros of this zeta function <laughs> lie on this line real z equals 1 and as i already said very little is known about this fact in fact something very simple as something that you might expect that something much simpler is also completely unknown which is so we just ask the following question how does zeta 1 behave is it zero is it non zero and if it is zero what is the order of that zero so answer is completely unknown and that conjecture which i referred to actually refers to this behavior so what uh, which smitter spinnerton dyer conjecture says is the following it's actually describes the behavior of zeta 1 okay and it uh okay let's do that and what is known is so this is a fact that if you look at this group of points on the elliptic curve group of rational points on this elliptic curve then this group has a fairly simple structure and the structure is like this that this group of points is uh, isomorphic to the following structure there is a set of points which is called the torsion points which are points of finite order 
So, which means that uh, if you add the point to itself a finite number of times, you get to 0, which is the infinity ele element here over the elliptic curve here, right. Then uh, there is this image of integers z and z to the r means the disjoint uh, sum of r copies of z. So, this group essentially is uh, a disjoint sum of r plus 1 subgroups. First one, uh, one of them is a torsion subgroup which is group of all points of finite order and then there are r copies of z. And this number r is not fixed, it can be 0, it can be 1, 2, but it is finite. Okay, so, this is known about the group of rational points on the elliptic curve, right. So, now we come back to this uh, conjecture. Now, if you recall the what is the zeta function def, uh, of the corresponding curve defined? This is equal to summation n greater than equal to 1 a n divided by n to the z, where a n in a sense measures the number of, okay, if n is prime then a n is number of points on this curve modulo p and for uh, other non-composite numbers there is some way that you can define this. So, a this numbers a sub n's are in, in a loose sense counting the points on this curve over uh, fields of finite characteristic or rings of finite characteristic. Okay, now now let's come to this conjecture. So this conjecture says not one, but if you look at the zeta z as a power series around z equals one, then how the behavior of this is the following. Say that the power series of zeta e at z equals 1 goes like z minus 1 to the r times a constant, and this constant also the conjecture describes very precisely. I am only going to describe two numbers in this constant, overall constant that occur. One is simple that is uh, the number of the size of this torsion subgroup, so that sits in the uh, denominator. In the numerator, there is uh, this number, okay, this, uh, the absolute value of omega 2, and this number will, this value will come to in a moment's time. When we talk about elliptic or over complex number, then this number will be defined. And then there are, there is another, some other numbers here which relate to certain other quantities associated with this elliptic curve plus the higher powers of z. So, Forgetting the constants, the main point here is that zeta 1 has a 0 of order r, where r is precisely the number of copies of z in the uh, group of rational points, which of course means that if r is uh, 0, then zeta e 1 is non zero. Is zero if and only if r is greater than zero and the order is exactly r. Now this is uh, conjecture has again is a fairly fairly recent origin. I think it was done in seventies, uh, nineteen seventies. So not very old conjecture. But interesting thing is that the point, this conjecture at the time this conjecture was defined, 
nothing was known about elliptic curve. I mean, this, for example, the fact that uh, the zeta function satisfies a functional equation is itself of recent vintage, right? 1990s. So at that point, it was not even clear whether there is a functional equation here, and uh, there was no reason to believe really why the why it should have a zero and the order should be precisely r. So what these guys did was they did an extensive computer experiment that is calculating for a specific elliptic curves, the zeros and the order of zeros, and then trying to look at the corresponding rational groups and order of those the cop number of copies, and that is how they using some more intuition plus this they formulated the conjecture. It remains uh, completely open and uh, in addition to Riemann hypothesis. This is also identified as one of the seven millennium problems. Okay. So, that is all I will say about this conjecture. So, now let us come to the other topic. Elliptic curves over complex. Now, one thing that should become immediately clear is that uh, that that the geometric picture we have in mind for elliptic curve, that there is this two independent curves. One is a closed curve, and the other is an infinite curve. That no longer holds over complex because the reason we th there are two independent curves is precisely that uh, there are some imaginary solutions in the in between region. So, over reals there they do not exist, but the moment you go over complex number they all the solutions do exist. In fact, it, for every value of y there will be precisely three values of x. Okay. So, that geometric picture will go away and interestingly and one may wonder what, what is the geometric picture that comes out of or once you look at over complex number and interesting part is that is actually a torus. But one has to do a little bit of work in uh, making this correspondence. So, exactly what I am going uh, correspondence would be is the following. Uh, so, let us first look at a torus. A torus is a sort of a circular thing which is which has actually two cycles in it, right. One is a big cycle and one is a small cycle. Now, as a geometric figure is simple enough and we can view it as follows. If you make a, uh, take the complex plane, okay, and you identify some parallelogram in the complex okay one end of which lying at zero but that's also not important okay it's a parallelogram now what you do is you cut out this parallelogram from the plane fold this so it's think of it as a paper then fold this this side folding onto this side and joining them so it makes a cylinder and then you take the cylinder and fold it on the along that x along the x axis and join the two circles together that becomes a torus. So, the, the effect here on this piece here is as if we are identified this line with this line by folding and this line with this line. Is that clear? So, that is a geometric or that is one way of forming a torus and it is a nice way in for our purpose because it gives an understanding of how do we uh, start from a complex plane. We already know some ways of twisting and turning complex plane in this various Riemann surfaces. So, this actually is another Riemann surface, another way of forming a Riemann surface from a complex plane. 
okay now what i promised you was that i'll elliptic curves i'll show the elliptic curves over complex number to be equivalent to torus in order to do that what i will need to do is to give a homomorphism actually an isomorphism from the points on a torus to the points on a elliptic curve and this isomorphism should preserve the group operation what is the group operation that is a good point we know the group operation on elliptic curve what is the group operation on torus well the group operation on torus is uh, again can be easily defined if you use this picture so the points on torus will be the points inside this the one thing that we have to be careful about is when we look at this piece we should ex the points in the torus are counted by taking these two edges in and the other two edges out okay so given any two points on this torus or on this piece what's a natural addition operation that you can define well these are two complex numbers let's add the two complex numbers that gives you to another complex number it's a very natural addition but then it also needs to be inside the same piece but this addition of these two may fall out of this piece okay so say addition of these two out is somewhere here and wrap it back so just think of this take the another copy of the same piece stick it there and wherever that this location is just pull it back here so in sense i'm saying is a uh, you are going double modular modular in this direction as well as modular in this direction so whichever way you go and then you come back to the same piece so that's a natural way of defining an addition of torus and that's it so that's this it's easy to see that the points on this piece or strip not strip this here these are closed under or form a group under such an addition operation with the identity being the zero that's why i said that we'll start will one end will keep at zero and we'll show that uh, the the mapping there is a isomorphism from the torus to the elliptic curve with preserved this group of operation basically we are doing it as a lattice with uh, these two bases added exactly so that's that's perfect observation yeah so essentially when you look at uh, this uh, structure you can think of it as a lattice on the complex plane right so if you look at consider this let's say this as omega 1 and this as omega 2 then uh, you can define a lattice to be m omega 1 plus n omega 2 m n in z which are again integers the set of all points that come out of such linear combinations form the lattice so every point at the corners of such pieces will be in a lattice right and uh, then the torus can just be viewed, viewed as complex numbers quotiented with this lattice so l is a group it's easy to see l is a group it's a commutative group so it can be you just quotient the set of group of complex numbers under addition with this lattice okay so that group that you get that's a group operation defined on this okay and now i want to give a mapping from this structure which is a torus to an elliptic curve now interesting the mapping that i'll go it will not only be an isomorphism of group structures but it will also be a meromorphism so with with all possible nice properties you can imagine there okay 
and in order to define that what I will do is I will go back to this structure here and define a function on the over the entire complex plane. I mean one thing that becomes very obvious is if this function which is from complex plane to complex, complex number to complex number, if it has to make sense over this as a function from C slash L, then it has to be periodic in, in that is if whatever value it takes at this point, it must take the same value at all point corresponding points in all the pieces here. So, this will have there is a two dimensional grid here right each one has a corresponding point to this here and at each one of those points the function value will have to be the same. So, this function is obviously a periodic function in fact it is more than periodic because it is a periodic is just typically along one. So, that is f of z is f of equal to f of k plus z and it is periodic with period k, but this function actually has two periods. So, if this is omega 1 omega 2 then we must have f of z equals f of z plus omega 1 and f of z plus omega 2 for all z. So, such functions are called doubly periodic. So, that is the minimum we will need. But as I said, we'll do more. We'll actually make this f a meromorphic function. But the moment you put uh, the condition of meromorphism on this such a function, which is doubly periodic, a number of interesting things happen. So let me quickly summarize that. So, there is an associated lattice L with this doubly periodic function, which is essentially all integer linear combinations of the two periods and F is a fundamental parallel pipette associated with the lattice, which is essentially that defining structure, which one point at 0, one edge at 0 that is important.
this theorem says that if you sum over all points z in f and look at the residues of each one of these points, the residues of f each one of these points in some of these. You recall what is the residue of f at a point, which it is the if you look at the power series expansion or Lorentz series expansion of f at that point, then is the coefficient of power of 1 over z, coefficient of 1 over z, right. So, that is the residue, the sum of all the residues is 0. Second, the same the sum over all such points in the in f, the order of f at z, the sum of that is, what is the order of f at z? Well, if f has a 0 at z, then the order is the smallest power of uh, smallest non zero power of the power series at z and if f has a pole at z then it is the uh, largest negative power that is non zero okay so if sum over the orders is also zero then order is defined to be 0. Residue and order both are defined to be 0 if there is uh, well residue is driven now obviously 0, but order is also defined to be 0. And third another very interesting property that f is a surjective map, not only it is surjective map, it has the interesting property that it given any value on the complex plane f takes a value z w for exactly L values of z counting multiplicities. This is another way of saying that f z minus w has a, a 0 of order L. Yeah. So, for it is not necessary that there are L distinct values of z taking value 0 here, because for one particular value of z the order of 0 may be higher. So, if you just add up the order of all the zeros for all z's of f z minus w that is exactly L, where L is precisely the sum of the order of f at all the poles inside f. If you look at the order of all the poles of f inside f, sum them up, they are all negative of course, and then take minus of that that is and the proof is fairly simple. This just uses the standard Cauchy's theorem. So, if you look at this uh, what is the What is this sum equal to? By Cauchy's theorem, this is simply the integral over delta f boundary of f, f w dw. Okay, and the boundary of f is defined to be zero to omega one plus omega one to omega one plus omega two plus omega 1 plus omega 2 to omega 2 omega 2 to 0 of f w d w okay and this is equal to okay let's go to the next page now integral from omega 1 to omega 1 plus omega 2 omega 1 plus omega 2 yeah of f w d w, you can do a change of variables and transform it from an integral from 0 to omega 2 of f w plus omega 1. Now, since w omega 1 is a period of f that is same as f w d w. So, it is I can write this as 0 to omega 2 and in exactly the same fashion I can eliminate omega 2 from here. So, it goes omega 1 to 0. which is of course 0. There is a small point here which I am skipping over that I am not am I assuming implicitly here that on the boundary of f there is no pole of 
boundary of capital F, there is no pole of function F. Then this argument goes through. If there is a pole, then you cannot really run through the integral line integral through that. So, what one needs to do is as you come to a pole, you just make a tiny circle around it. Now, by periodicity, if there is a pole on one edge, there will be a corresponding pole on the other parallel edge there. So, whatever circle you do, you same circle you do that. So, again they will cancel out each other and then you will get uh, this here. Similarly, uh, if you look at the second one, sum of this, again this is uh, straightforward because This again by I think this is by Cauchy's integral formula that this is equal to I think we derived this. The residues of f prime over f is precisely the orders of the vanishing, either zero or four with positive negative sign. Okay. So, that is this. Now, f prime over f is also a doubly periodic function with the same period. Why? If f is period, doubly periodic, that is it, is it, there is a period. If you look at f prime, it will be again the same doubly periodic function because it is the values remain the same. So, as you move across the one piece to the next piece, you will again get the same derivatives all over the place. So, f prime is also doubly periodic with the same periods. So, f prime over f is also doubly periodic with the same periods. Okay. And therefore, this integral we just showed is a 0. For, a, for any doubly periodic function, this integral was 0. So, this would be 0. Okay. And third one was to, is to show that uh, given, a, so you just consider f z minus w, this function. w is fixed. So, this function is also w periodic with the same periods. Since it is w periodic with the same periods, if you look at the uh, fundamental parallel pivot, which again the same fundamental parallel pivot will hold, will be exist for this also. All you are doing is you are shifting every value at every point in for f by this amount w. So, it like remains a w periodic with the same fundamental parallel pipette. So, if you focus inside the fundamental parallel pipette, the sum of this is going to be, uh, okay, let us just use this, the second one. Sum of the orders of this function inside fundamental parallel pipette is 0. Now, there are two possibilities. Possibility one is that it has no poles. If this function has no poles, then because it is a doubly periodic function, f has no poles anywhere. In fact, f is bounded. Now, if f is bounded, okay, I should have gone back and modify this. And f is not constant. Because if f is constant, now obviously it's doubly periodic, and obviously this part three is false because it takes only one value everywhere. Uh, I should also say z in f. So that is how many values, how many z's inside f are there for which you attain the value w? Because again, if it is since it's periodic then there are infinitely many values on which it takes particular value, but that is not what we are interested in. Okay, so, consider f z minus w, then uh, this is w periodic the same period. So, summation sum of orders is this is 0. Now, if f has, if f has no poles, then it is constant. And if f ha does have a pole, then let us say we are already saying that L is the sum of all the orders of poles. Okay. 
So, sum of the orders of pole is L, then by 2 sum of the orders of 0 must also be L. In fact, sum of the orders of poles is minus L, sum of orders of 0 must be L, which is another way of saying that the number of zeros of this function inside the fundamental pile of pipe are L counting multiple. The last one. So, now L is the sum of the orders or of all the poles or rather minus L is the sum of the orders. Minus L is the sum of the orders of all the poles, okay, minus L because orders of poles are negative. If F has no pole, then inside the fundamental parallel pipe head, the value of F is bounded. So it is a compact set and if its value is bounded, then it remains bounded by uh, periodicity, it remains bounded everywhere. Now, f a function which is whose value if an f is of course, right, f is meromorphic. So, this is an again a old theorem we proved. A meromorphic function whose value is bounded over the entire complex plane is actually a constant. So, now coming back to this, to say the sum of the orders of f is 0, the sum of the orders of f at all the points inside the fundamental parallel pipe is 0. Now, if you just separate these the points poles and zeros. So, poles add up to minus L. So, zeros will also the orders of zeros will also add up to L. So, what is the meaning of this? That there are certainly zeros of F in the fundamental parallel pipet. Further, their orders add up to L. So, applying this to that to this function, it means that there are points Z inside the fundamental parallel pipet on which this function is 0 in the f, w, f z minus w. So, it is a doubly periodic function with f capital F sorry with the same property, with the same property. because this result that 1 and 2 hold for any doubly periodic function which is meromorphic and as a par fundamental parallel pi by del uh, f right. So, this f z minus w also falls in the same category. So, the point the theorem 2 or part of the th part 2 of the theorem holds for this function as well, fine. Now, poles of this function are same as poles of f. So, it borrows its poles from f, but zeros of course, it does not borrow from f, zeros are at other, at other locations, but what is guaranteed is that some of the orders of zeros is exactly. So, that is a kind of function we need if we have to define a map from a torus to complex plane. So, what is what kind of maps can can exist which satisfy this because it is certainly fairly non trivial in order to satisfy all these properties. So, there are this very nice Weyer stresses, uh, well, I do not know, this is probably rho. Anybody an expert in Greek alphabet? Does not matter, it is what? Yeah, it is, it is that is right, but it is W L, does not matter, let us call it whatever, let us call it rho, rho function, as long as we are clear what it means. So, let L be a lattice, then define rho z 
to be. So this is 1 over z square plus sum over all lattice points except 0 because in 0 this will get messed up 1 by z minus omega square minus 1 over omega square. Okay. So, here is a nice theorem about this it says that first ensures the convergence of f is well defined at every non lattice point. At every lattice point of course, there is a pole. Uh, second would is that z is equal to rho minus z and rho of z plus omega is equal to rho of z. So, it is and this is for all w omega in n. So, this is doubly periodic for the lattice over the lattice end. Okay. And third is uh, This is even more interesting that any doubly periodic function over L has this form. It is a rational function which involves rho and rho prime. So, it is a rational function in rho and rho prime over complex numbers. Any rational function over rho and rho prime is obviously doubly periodic for L. And this part says that that is all there is, there is nothing more. And of course, uh, rho has uh, a pole of order 2 at every point in the lattice. That is also fairly obvious, just look at this definition any point in the lattice there is a pole of order 2. We have to do a little bit of work to ensure that the rest of the sum uh, in this series converges, but that follows essentially from part 1. Okay. Uh, the proof of all of this is fairly straightforward, okay, not part 3, which I am not going to prove. Even part 1 I am not going to prove, but I will give a very brief sketch. So, if you look at uh, So, start by considering any point z such that uh, absolute value of z is less than absolute value of omega for all lattice points in omega except 0. Okay. Then for that uh, particular z, if you consider this expression, I can rewrite this as uh, And 
this, I am going to now use the fact that absolute value of z by omega is less than 1 by using this property and therefore, I can expand it as a power series and the power series is of this square 1 minus x whole square that if you remember the power series of this is equal to okay, let me see if I can You get this, and just swap over the sums you get 1 by z square plus So, just rearranging some essentially you get uh, this power series well it is a Lorentz series with uh, the coefficient here which is in sum over all lattice point except 0 of 1 over omega to the n plus 2. This actually one can show it converges and it converges to uh, the value which is called the Eisenstein series. So, this is the n plus 2 th Eisenstein series defined for that lattice. Okay, so, this sum is an Eisenstein series, the infinite sum and it is a, okay. and uh, simple fact about this is that okay, let me just rewrite write first few terms of this 1 by z square plus if you will consider n equals 1 then this is g 3. If you consider g 3 the sum is 0 that is g 3 is 0 why g 3 is 0 because if omega is in the lattice, then minus omega is also in the lattice. Okay. And so, if you have an odd power of omega sitting here, then they will just cancel each other out. In fact, so g odd is 0. So, this actually would be um, the smallest value this will survive is 3 g 4 z squared plus uh, next one which is z to the 4 right 5 g 6 z to the 4 plus 1. So, that is the power series expansion of rho around z equals 0. So, what was because 0 is in the lattice. So, on linear combinations of so 0 see if omega 1 is in the lattice, omega 2 is in the lattice then all linear combination integer linear combination omega omega 2 are in the lattice. Okay. So, basically that shows that it converges convergence is essentially comes out of this fact 
that you have what is it yeah you just do a bit of manipulation here you get convergence but i'm i'll skip over that i'll my mostly interested in this and now i am ready to give this map which i promised that from a torus to an elliptic curve so this is rho z expanded in a lorentz series around z equals 0 where it has a double pole okay now consider the derivative of this rho prime of z if you just look at this what is the rho prime of z going to be minus 2 over z cube plus 6 g z plus 20 g 6 z cube plus Okay, now let's do a bit more work. What is rho cube of z? And we'll only focus on those powers of z which are negative or zero. The rest we'll just ignore. So what are the non? What are the negative less than equal to zero powers of rho cube that exist? Cube of this, square of this times this, that's also negative. Square of this times this is zero. No, 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 cube it, cube the whole. Part. Anything else? So that's it. There is no. Other. There only you get only three terms: cube of this, square of this times this, and square of this times this. Any other any other term will be higher power. So what are those terms? So you get one over z to the six. That's a cube. Plus square of this times this. There's a three. So there is a three choose two times this. There is three times this times this. So it's a nine. z square plus square of this times this which is 15 g 6 plus the rest okay and square rho prime 